I've said this before, but I always think this grounds me when I'm looking at data uh, because, uh, you know, it gives me a sense of the challenges that we have um, and, and it really um, gives me a sense of urgency. Um, but, but this isn't any surprise. I mean, I think uh, um, you've seen these graphs before. If you look at your white, uh, this is MCA proficiency for mathematics. 78% um, of white students are proficient. Um, if you look at the far left, 19% of our American Indian students. 21% uh, African American English speaking. Um, so you see 56 point or more, 50 point achievement gaps. Um, African American, non-English, 25%. Uh, but you see significant gaps in achievement based on race. And as Michael talked about, uh, this commitment to learning, this positive identity, you don't see those necessarily those gaps there. Uh, so we know that students want to learn, they want to do well. And so our job as a district is to try to determine how do we get there. Reading is the same story. Uh, you see, you see a 57 point difference between our African American uh, proficiency scores and reading, 20% uh, for American Indian, 57% uh, difference in terms of the percentage of students that are proficient. All right, and it's glaring. I mean, I, I like to show this because it, it's just, um, it's really shocking in terms of the work we do. And this is a proficiency share. Um, if you look at that 50, uh, the number is at the bottom. The 50 is what we consider proficiency. Um, and if you look at the blue, the blue are the white students, right? So if you move, draw a line, a vertical line on that 50, you see a really a disproportionate number of white students, right, that are above 50. That 50 represents proficiency, right? If you look at the um, African American, which would be the purple, right, there's a larger chunk of students that are, in our case, 35 and below. The reason why I like to show this, you see the same with American Indian, for example, we have about 50% of our African American and American Indian students in our district, um, roughly 40% of our Hispanic students that are two or more grade levels behind, over 50%. The reason why that becomes very significant is you think about what are the social emotional skills that these students are going to need, right? This perseverance, this grit, this academic, what are the skills they're going to need to, do, to become motivated enough to bridge that gap, okay? What are, what are the, the skills that are going to need to put in the extra time to work harder, to have that willingness to stay after school? What are the social emotional skills that are going to need for some of our students um, who are going to have to work extra jobs? They're going to have to work when they get home. But we know that many students, there are some students who work two or three hours, uh, they take care of their sister or brother, um, and they continue to do their homework. All right? um, you know, there's always those students that we know um, that have figured it out, that have keep pushing through. Um, so those students, even if we turn that light bulb on, those students are going to have commitments at home. They're going to have commitments and a responsibility to persevere, to continue to push through and make up those skill gaps. All right? And, you know, in many cases, adults, we can provide those opportunities for students, uh, but they're still going to have to put in the work and the time uh, and, and, and push through. Uh, and so there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, this is the percentage of students attending 95% of the time. Um, you know, the relevant part of this is 95% is roughly nine days or less. 17, 90%, uh, 17 absence. Students are 85% as they've missed roughly 26 days of school. Okay. Um, and so the first thing that I see when I look at this is obviously there's a, uh, there's a gap in attendance as early as kindergarten uh, between our American Indian and our white students, African American and our white students. In fact, by third grade, you can estimate that an American Indian student continuously enrolls probably missed about a month more of school, roughly, than our white students. Um, I'll, when I show you the, the uh, uh, academic persistence measures, you'll see um, that that gap, if you look at this graph and you look at grade eight to nine, you start seeing that significant drop um, in the attendance for students, particularly for American Indian students, right? Um, when I'll show you the persistence uh, slides, you'll start seeing a drop on the transitions, grades five to six. And so we're trying to, to examine, okay, what is the relationship between um, that drop in persistence um, at, at those early grade levels and then the subsequent drop in attendance, right, at, at the eight to nine? Because we know transitions matter, particularly for our most vulnerable populations. Suspensions, we know we have disproportionality. Um, you know, you can typically, a lot of these disproportionality graphs, look at the top bar. Those are gonna be your African-American students, right? Uh, that's the unfortunate truth. Uh, but you look at African-American males, uh, one, two, if you look at the second uh, group to the right, um, you know, this is, uh, now we put this here to show that we've read drastically, you know, we've reduced suspensions. 
Um, that's an effort that we've uh, done as a district, but the disproportionality is continuing to be glaring. Um, and so 17% of African-American males uh, the previous year, 13% uh, roughly this year have been suspended. Uh, compared to, if you look at the smaller numbers, your white students, um, I mean, those are all almost invisible. When you look at the number, if you look at your far left, uh, number of suspensions for your white students. And then obviously four-year graduation rate. I mean, gaps there as well. American Indian students, 29% of American Indian, 42% um, for our um, African-American and English speaking, 45% uh, Hispanic. And so, again, um, you know, this is, again, uh, supporting evidence for the data Michael showed is that there is a distinct relationship. Um, students want to do well. We know that. Um, and so how do we as a system, how do we as a community support those feelings that students have to change the trajectory of these outcomes? This is a framework that I found useful. This comes out of the University of Chicago Urban Education Institute. Uh, we're doing some work with Camille Farrington. Uh, Camille has uh, done significant research and she calls it non-cognitive. Um, and then in other fields, social emotional. In fact, our student services department, they says, Eric, you really have to say social emotional, not non-cognitive. But Camille says non-cognitive. Uh, but this is looking at, at all the different things. Now, if you look at the student background characteristics, the school and classroom context at the top, what I really like to, is, is that we've done some uh, work on the concept of cost stereotype threat, and basically we're looking at the interaction between, there's an interaction between the student's background and the school and classroom context and also the teacher's identity, right? Between those two spaces, there's a relationship that's formed, okay? I say that because, um, you know, I really believe that there isn't any learning that takes place if there isn't a relationship there first, right? Um, and in fact, sometimes we go right to some of the growth mindset, or we go right to teaching students how to do school, and if there's not a relationship, those students aren't going to listen to a word you're saying. Okay. In fact, that's why you see some variation and depending on the school setting, the classroom setting or the out of school time setting, um, you do see some, uh, uh, students receive information very differently. But then you see the academic mindsets. Um, somewhere between the academic mindsets and the academic perseverance, which is lacking perseverance, think about that as kind of your grit measures, um, which is your long-term goal setting. Um, we think that an academic persistence measure that I'll show you is falling in between there. And I'll have a chance to share why. Um, but if you look at uh, these definitions here, so academic mindsets, um, I belong in the academic community, right? I can succeed, this work has value for me. Um, social skills, this is something that I think our student support services department really does a good job in terms of, um, and this could be your soft skills, the interpersonal skills, the cooperation, responsibility, right? You see in the middle the grit, self-discipline, self-control, to the right learning strategies. Sometimes we go right to the academic behaviors. Um, you, know, you know, one of the strategies that we do, and I'll admit it, is sometimes we look at students who are underachieving, and the strategy is to give those students planners, right? And we, because we're trying to teach them how to do school. Or we say, well, let's give them more homework. Um, and in fact, we know that if you don't have that piece at the top, which is the academic mindset, if there isn't a relationship, if there aren't those social emotional skills, you're not going to see those things work, right? And so this is one of the conversations, one, that we're having with our school social workers, for example, to say everyone has a role to play in increasing academic achievement. In fact, those students are two to three grade levels below, right? Someone's got to be able to get those students re-engaged in the domain of learning. Um, and, and that's where that social emotional, how do you re-engage? How do you mirror those things when you look at students who are not of school time programs and they're passionate about, um, you know, music and art? or maybe the service learning, maybe it's applied mathematics, maybe it's applied literacy. Uh, maybe it's they, they, students enjoy poetry, but they don't necessarily like what you're doing in class, right? And so how do we re-engage those students in the learning process? This is GRIT, um, and there's been a lot of research by GRIT by Angela Duckworth, long-term effort and persistence, and we know through that research um, that if you have GRIT, this idea that, you, that you're pursuing a long-term goal, there's a positive relationship with the GPAs, they persevered, commitment to practicing, fewer suicidal thoughts, greater psychological well-being, higher levels of happiness. The literature is clear there. But we're, again, interested in how do you go from, um, you know, long-term goals are great, but how do you get to the short-term goals? Um, you know, when we think about uh, uh, short-term goals, when we think of the learning process, this is where this becomes fascinating for me. Because if you think about the learning process, okay, think about any time that, that any of us have learned something. 
okay? There's a process where someone's giving you information and here's the relationship you're trusting that information is valuable to you, which causes you to engage in the process, right? We also know learning is challenging. Learning, learning is challenging. You're entering a domain where you don't necessarily know the information. So there's a piece where what does it take to get you to continue in that learning process, to continue to go through failure until you break through to acquire the knowledge? Right? That's what we consider persistence, okay? Um, which is continued task engagement even when confronted with failures. Um, and in fact, uh, we like to think about it as, in our district, refusal to give up in spite of difficulty.